that was a young lady that was coming to Atlanta to take the SET. She talking to her grandmother. She said, Grandma, I'm nervous. I've never been to the big city. She said, baby, take this handkerchief with you. And as you take the test, you come to a question that you don't understand, that you have a problem with. You look at the handkerchief. She started taking the test. The lady that was giving the test kept watching her. She kept looking up, look down, she right. Look up, look down, she right. After the test was given, the lady said, young lady, come to my desk. I think you were cheating. I saw you kept looking down. She said, no, ma'am, I'm not cheating. So why you kept looking down, writing, then look up? She said, well, my grandmother gave me a handkerchief, and she told me to always look at a handkerchief, and everything I need was inside the handkerchief. She said, well, let me see it, baby. She opened it up. She had a rock. A rock, but on the rock, it was wrote Jesus. Come on, Anderson. Whatever you need tonight, you just look at Jesus. Let's go, Deacon. Come on, come on, Anderson. Good evening, sir. Our scripture this afternoon is taken from the 100 divisions of Psalms, standing for the reading of God's word. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lamb. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people yeah, yeah. and the sheep of his pastor. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his court with praise. Yeah, yeah. Be thankful unto him yeah. and bless his name. Mm. For the Lord is good. Yeah. His mercy is everlasting mm -hmm. and his truth endureth to all generations. Yeah. Amen. Amen. May God may a blessing to the reader, the doers, and the hearers of his word. Yes. Come on, Dick. Come on now. Thank God. <laughs> Praise the Lord, everybody. Yes. Praise the Lord, everybody. Yes. For this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Yes. Do y'all mind if we go back a little bit tonight? Yes. I believe y'all will help me. Don't leave me by myself, okay? Trouble in, my way. Trouble in my way, I have to cry sometimes. <laughs> so much trouble, <laughs> I have to cry sometimes. <laughs> well, I lay awake at night, <laughs> but that's all I. I heard him say, Jesus, after a while, yeah, trouble in my way, I have to cry sometimes, yeah. Stepped in the furnace a long time ago. Yes, shall be shall and up in the Well, but they wouldn't worry.
Amen. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come thank you once again, Lord, for another day that you made, Lord. Thanks for waking us up one more time. Just see another blessed day, Father God. What a beautiful day it is, and we just say thank you, Lord. You've been mighty good, Father God, and we just say thank you, Lord. As we come on this first night of revival, Lord, we just thank you, Father God, that we are here, Father God, to be revived, Father God. Lord, let somebody get saved, Lord, in this revival, Lord. Thank you, Father God. We just love you so much, Father God, and we know everything's going to be all right, Father God. Lord, we just come with a heavy heart on tonight. Lord, just thank you for your goodness, Father God. Lord, death is all around, Father God. We just lost two loved ones in the last seven days, Father God, and we just ask them for your prayer. Lord, just keep us, Father God. Thank you, Lord. Bless this, my family, Father God, and we just bless all over this land, Father God. Bless each one right now, Lord. Thank you, Father. Bless our pastor on today, Lord. Give him strength. Bless his wife and family, Lord. We know, Lord, that you, he's doing your will, Father God. Bless the man that's going to stand in Paul's shoes on tonight, Lord. Give him a word for your people, Father God. And we just say thank you, Lord. Bless all the sick and shut in, all the bereaved families all over this land, Lord. There's so much is going on, but we know you still got it under control, Father. Thank you, Jesus, for this day that you have made. And we ask it all in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Oh, that sums up our purpose for being here. We have come to praise the Lord's name. And certainly great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. We certainly want to say good evening, Beulah and friends who are joining us here in the sanctuary and those who are viewing from your other locations as this service is being streamed, this revival service is going out all across Metro Atlanta, the state of Georgia, and the nation. And we are just rejoicing for the fact that you are here. Amen. But you know what? It's just something about being in the sanctuary, in the temple. Amen. And we praise and thank God for each and every one of you. Thank you, choir. Amen. For blessing us. Amen. Well, this is our first revival Amen. since we were struck by that terrible pandemic. Amen. It has been a number of years since we have been in revival. Amen. But we are here tonight. God has made it possible for us to come together again in revival service, amen. And I know of no better way to go into our spring than in this way. We want to again say welcome to all of our members and our visiting friends who are joining us on this evening. Uh, but we want to just acknowledge all visitors who are not members of Beulah, but you're with us on this evening. We value your presence so highly, so greatly. Would you please stand wherever and whomever you may be. Amen, amen. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. We have a number of visiting ministers and pastors. Amen. And we praise God for each of you. Amen. And brothers and sisters, we are so very thankful to God. Uh, and we want to say thank you to our deacons for the devotion. Thank you so much. Amen. We want to make mention of the fact that it's always in all of uh, that we, when we gather together, uh, that we make it possible for men and women, boys and girls, to come to Jesus. Prior to this revival, there's been a special time of dedication devoted for prayer, praying for God's blessings, praying for God to meet us here, praying for the presence of God to fill this temple, praying that God would bless us, uh, that someone, some man, some woman, some boy, some girl would decide to give their life to the Lord. Amen. 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 And so all throughout the course of this service, please let us be one in prayer. Praying, amen, for the presence of the Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we want to prepare our hearts now as we prepare to come very quickly with our offering. We want to be able to, amen, come with our offering because once, amen, the preacher gets through, amen, and we've extended the invitation, we want to be able uh, to depart from this place with the message still burning in our hearts. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. We're so grateful for our ushers and certainly for our nurses who are with us on this evening along with our choir, our deacons, our mothers. Thank you so much. Amen. God bless you. We want to prepare our hearts, minds, and spirits to come now with our offering. Lord God, we thank you afresh 
for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us far too numerous dear father for us to begin to even count dear father the song once said count your blessings and dear father we try to count them but we haven't been able to count them all but for everything that you have done for every door that you have opened, for every way that you have made, we just want to say thank you. And Father, as we prepare to come now, bringing our offerings, we pray your choice blessings upon all of your people as we come. For we lift this prayer, we lift this petition to you in the precious name of Jesus. And we say thank you, Lord, and amen. Amen and amen. God bless you. Will we please stand at this time following the directions of our ushers? Amen. Uh, who are going to direct us as we come? Ushers, where are you? <laughs> All right. Amen. Amen. They're going to direct us as we come. All right. Amen.
Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Father God, we come to you once again. We pause again, dear Father, to acknowledge you with a tremendous spirit of reverence and praise. We, Father, thank you for these, your people, who have given. And, dear Father, we ask your choice blessings upon each and every one of them. Those who are viewing, dear Father, but will be sending in their revival offerings, we thank you for them. Bless all of your people. The wonderful thing about it, Father, is you know exactly what we need. And you have the power to supply all of our needs. Bless your people now, dear Father. You know their addresses. You know, dear Father, exactly where they're located. Shower down your blessings. Pour out your favor. And we shall remain ever grateful and faithful in giving you the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray and we say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And amen. amen. God bless you. God bless you. Let all of the people of God say amen. amen. Again, we have gathered here uh, for this first revival at Beulah since the pandemic. Amen. And we know that a lot of things were closed and shut and we couldn't come together and enjoy. But we give God glory, honor, and praise once more. Amen. For blessing us to make our way again. I thought about it during the pandemic what Jesus told Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell, including the pandemic, shall not prevail against it. Amen. We were out for a while, but guess what? We're back now. Amen. And somebody brought with them, I'm, I'm a glad to be back, spirit. Amen, amen. Glory to his name. Well, brothers and sisters, it's preaching time. And really, our preacher needs no introduction, for he has favored us with his powerful preaching on many past occasions. He is a long time dear friend of mine and our friendship dates back, amen, a number of decades. When we were both pastoring in the state of Arkansas in the city of Little Rock, he was then pastor of the St. Mark Baptist Church and I was then pastor of the Greater Paradise Baptist Church. And that was a tremendous fellowship, not only between he and myself, but between our churches. Amen. And once a month, we look forward to coming together in fellowship. Amen. And it was called a four church fellowship because of two other pastors who were a part of it. Amen. Uh, but the fellowship, even though, amen, I'm no longer in Little Rock, uh, our preacher, Reverend Watson, has returned to Little Rock. Amen. Amen. He's back in Little Rock where he got his start. And I, I told him I've been at his installations practically every church he's gone to, but I ain't going to no more. Stay where you're at. Stay there. Amen. Amen. But in all sincerity, he is a powerful preacher, one who loves the Lord. Amen. And not just one who preaches well, but who is also 
a good preacher because he lives the life that he preaches about. I had the privilege of marrying him and his wife, Janice. Amen. And we've shared so many, so many experiences together. And when back in those days, when Watson, we both had afros. And... <laughs> Amen. I don't know whether you had any bell bottoms or not, but Amen. Amen. But back in those days, amen, it was amen, something to remember, amen. And if we can get a hold of a picture of him back then, we may feature it on the screen before this week is over. Not one of mine, amen. We love him dearly, he is a brother beloved, amen. And so Beulah, I want us to pray with him and pray for him. Amen. Uh, that the anointing of God will be upon him. That he can bring us a powerful word. I'm so glad to have with us on this evening. Amen. The Reverend Dr. Christopher Campbell of the Israel Baptist Church. Amen. My membership church. Amen. And we're so happy to have, amen, Dr. Campbell with us on this evening. It was our privilege to be with them last week. Amen. On Tuesday evening in their spring revival. Amen. It was a wonderful time. Thank you for the invitation. But thank you for joining us here. Amen. On this evening along with all of our other wonderful ministers. Amen. Now brothers and sisters, our preacher is the pastor of the Second Baptist Church of Little Rock, Arkansas. And if you ever have an occasion to go there and to be there on uh, the weekend and certainly on a Sunday, try to make your way over, amen, to Second Baptist Church. You'll be greatly blessed. Amen. Following this next selection from the choir, amen. The next voice that we will hear will be that of our evangelist, amen. This spring revival preacher. Amen. In the person of the Reverend Dr. Maurice Watson. God bless you.
Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we are thankful and grateful to you for the privilege that is ours tonight to worship you in a collective and corporate way. We come before you, Lord, and we acknowledge that all of our help comes from you. And without you, we can't make it. We confess our sins before you. We ask you to forgive us, cleanse us even now. Thank you, Lord, for how you continue to look beyond our faults and see our needs. We're not ashamed to publicly declare how much we need you. And we can't get along without you. Now, God, as I stand to proclaim your word, I pray for a fresh anointing a fresh enablement, a fresh empowerment of your Holy Spirit. 
Use me now in such a way that everything that I will do and say will only be done and only be said so that you might receive the glory. We know that whenever your word goes forward that our common enemy in the invisible ram will do all that he can to hinder your word. So in the name of Jesus, we pray that every scheme and every plan of the enemy would be canceled out. And we say, have your way, Lord, in us, through us and among us, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this indeed is the day the Lord has made. We ought to rejoice and be glad in it. How many of you are glad to be in the house of the Lord? The psalmist says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. In other words, don't make me sing a solo. And let us exalt his name together. I certainly want to take this moment to recognize the angel of this house, the shepherd of this flock, the pastor of this church, my friend, your pastor, Pastor Jerry, Dr. Jerry D. Black. To all of the pastors who are present tonight, Pastor Campbell and all the pastors and ministers who are here tonight, to First Lady, Kate, it's so good to see you. And to the officers and members of the Beulah Church, to each of us, brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an honor and a privilege to have once again been invited to come to share uh, with you here at Beulah for a few nights and, you know, to have the first revival since the pandemic. I will take the liberty to say it's only right that you invited me <laughs> because I believe I preached the first revivals when you uh, became pastor of this church back in 1993. You got here in 91. I think I came in 93. So it's only right, Jerry, <laughs> that you would invite me to come back. No, I am so honored, Pastor Black and those preachers across the length and breadth of this country that he could have invited, but I want him to know how honored and thankful I am uh, to have been invited by him again. And to know, you know, in, in life, Billy Graham says that if in life you meet five people that you can call a friend, consider yourself fortunate. Amen. I am more than fortunate to have known Pastor Jerry Black as my personal friend and brother over 40 years amen and just to uh, be in his presence is always a blessing for me so thank you thank you Jerry for uh, inviting me to come um, and please do not put any pictures from yesteryears <laughs> on the screen uh, you know I, I had an afro and it ran off <laughs> and Jerry's afro got scared and turned gray <laughs> So, uh, no, please, please don't do that. <laughs> um, there's a word I want to share with you tonight. It's found in the Gospel of Matthew. Let me read into your hearing a paragraph. Matthew chapter 26. I want to read into your hearing verses 47 through 56. Matthew chapter 26 verses 47 through 56. Wow. Reading from the New King James Bible, if you found this passage, can you indicate as such by saying amen? amen? Here's how my Bible reads. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he's the one, seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand, drew his sword, and struck Jesus. 
the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father, and he'll provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? In that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, have you come out as a gangs of robber with swords and clubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. I, I want to put a tag on the text tonight and I want to talk about keeping your power under control. Yeah. Keeping your power under control. The man said he was looking for a one-armed one lawyer. A one-armed attorney, how come, his friend asked. He said, I'm looking for an attorney who won't say on the one hand, on the other hand. Ernest Campbell has suggested that some truths require two hands. Philosophers call such truths paradoxes. A paradox consists of two statements about a reality that seem to contradict each other, neither of which is complete without the other. We have friends in this passage today, a series of strange paradoxes. They can be seen in this encounter between Jesus and Judas. How strange it is that one who was so powerful appeared to be so powerless. He was about to be arrested by an angry mob, tried in the kangaroo court, and crucified as a common criminal on a cross. He would be completely at the mercy of the Roman soldiers that were guarding him. He had no army, no military power. He had no friends in high places, no political power. He had no money or land to give in exchange for his freedom, no economic power. All of his followers would eventually desert him. It appears, friends, that for all practical purposes, that Jesus was the least powerful man in Palestine. But the overriding paradox of the passion scene is that at that very moment, Jesus was not only the most powerful man in Palestine, but he was the most powerful man on the face of the earth. He was not at the mercy of Judas, the mob, nor the Roman soldiers. On the contrary, they were at his mercy. What a strange paradox of power to be so powerful and yet appear so powerless. Powerlessness is antithetical to our human nature, is it not? Alan Perkins has suggested that no one likes to feel powerless. It feels frustrating to feel powerless. To feel like things are happening beyond your control. To feel like things are happening without your consent. And when we feel powerless, we get the urge to do something to prove to ourselves that we are not powerless. And so we do something strange. We do something harmful. We do something dangerous, if you will just to prove that we are not powerless. A, uh, a, a, a man feels powerless on his job. His boss is always telling him what to do, boxing him in, controlling him. And so one day in order to show his boss that he's not powerless, he gets the nerve to tell his boss to take this job and shove it. <laughs> a woman feels powerless in her marriage. Her husband is a tyrant, so she quits, she leaves, she uh, has an affair, she files for a divorce just to prove that she has some control over her own life. A teenager re resents the power and authority of her parents and so she begins to act out in dangerous ways, getting involved with drugs and sex just to prove her independence. And yet, friends, I submit to you that we learn a valuable lesson from Jesus in this text. And that is that we are most powerful when our lives are submitted to the plans and purposes of God. While he was still speaking, 
he was first to notice what the sleepy disciples didn't he could hear the measured marching of Judas and the mob coming with their swords he caught a glimpse of the glare of their lantern of, of their torches and lanterns through the trees he could see the silhouette of the swarming mob marching with their clubs and swords but worst of all he saw his traitor guiding the party through the garden through to his familiar place of recluse let us be going jesus said see my betrayer is at hand while he was still speaking judas and the mob showed up but what would jesus do at such a critical hour would he fight would he run would he annihilate his enemies or would he use his divine power and simply vanish out of their sight? But no, with a calm, with a controlled, and with a calculated resolve, Jesus shows us what true power looks like. That to be truly powerful is to submit your life to the plans and purposes of God. And so friends in a series of paradoxical movements I just want to share with you these little paradoxes regarding power I'll make some some comments and I promise you I'll be in my seat you're going to have you're going to be a person uh, uh, like Jesus you got to learn to have your power under control and when power is under control because his power was under control he had the power to call his enemy his friend the Bible says in verse 27 that Judas, that, uh, that, 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 that Matthew along with the other synoptic writers are careful to tell us that Judas was one of the twelve. In order to highlight the treachery of his intentions that one of his own disciples had betrayed him. The Bible says that Judas showed up with a mob, a crowd of people. This crowd of people probably uh, uh, consisted of uh, some temple guards, some hired men, and a contingency of Roman soldiers. They were armed, Matthew says, with swords and clubs, as if they had intended to arrest a serious criminal. Perhaps uh, Judas feared that the 11 would defend Jesus at any cost, and so that, they, that would there would be no confusion in the darkness. Judas had given the prison guards, if you will, the Roman soldiers, a sign saying, whomever I kiss, he's the one, seize him. The Bible says that Judas in verse 48 walks up to Jesus and says, greetings, Rabbi, and then he kissed him. Oh, child of God, might I submit to you today, don't you hate being around people like Judas? Fake phony false Judas's I mean if you're going to be my enemy then come out of the closet and be my enemy but don't smile in my face and stick a knife in my back what would Jesus do he could have pulled away from Judas he could have annihilated Judas he could have scolded Judas and said, how dare you kiss me? But Jesus endured the treacherous kiss. And Jesus said to Judas, friend, why have you come? Oh, what a strange paradox that Jesus had the power to call his enemy his friend. Um... When you ever get a chance, you ought to watch the Godfather trilogy. I try to watch it at least once a year. You'll learn a lot watching those gangsters. In Godfather 3, when Michael Corleone had turned over the family's business to his nephew Vincent Mancini, young Mancini wanted to settle some old scores. But the old Don said to him, never hate your enemies because it clouds your judgment. How interesting it is that the words of a gangster seem to parallel the sentiments of the Savior who said, love your enemies. Bless those who do evil to you. Do good to those who do evil to you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. What a strange paradox. 
that Jesus was able to call his enemy his friend. I submit to you, however, that maybe Jesus was able to call Judas his friend because he knew the role that his enemy would, would play toward pushing him toward his purpose and destiny. One day, Jesus said to the disciples, hey, fellas, who do men say that I am? They said, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah, one of the big shots of the Old Testament. He said, well, who do you think I am? Peter raised his hand and said, I got it. You are the Christ son of the living God. Jesus said, Peter, you got it right, but the only reason you got it right because my daddy gave you the cheat sheet. He said, fellas, I need to tell you something. That in a few days, uh, I I'm going to go to Calvary's cross and they're going to crucify me and kill me on the cross. Uh, and Peter, who was Jesus' friend, did not want to see his friend experience the pain of the, of the cross. And, G and Peter, big mouth Peter, called himself rebuking Jesus and said, be that far from you, Lord. And Jesus turned around and looked at Peter, his friend, and called his friend the devil. He said, get behind me, Satan. In other words, Peter, I know you're my friend, and because you're my friend, you don't want to see me experience the pain of Calvary. But Peter, you don't know what spirit is using you now, because my purpose for coming into the world is that I might experience the pain of the cross. And if I don't experience the pain of the cross, Peter, you're going to still be in your sin. Look at that child of God. Jesus called his friend the devil, because his friend didn't want to see him face the pain of Calvary but he calls his enemy his friend he said Judas I know you're gonna cause me some pain and I know you don't mean me no good but Judas the pain that you gonna cause me is only going to push me into my purpose and into my destiny can I preach a while tonight and tell you you need a Judas in your life Oh, yes, you do. Judas will make you pray. Judas will drive you to your knees. Judas makes you get closer to God. Matter of fact, you ought to go home and write a thank you note to all of your Judases. Dear Judas, thank you for dogging me out. Dear Judas, thank you for talking about me. Dear Judas, thank you for all the evil things you did to me because the stuff you did to me, Judas, only pushed me into my purpose and into my destiny. I don't know what Judas is you face in life, but the easy thing to do is to cuss your Judas is out. But the Lord says if you're going to be like Christ, you got to keep your power under control and learn how to treat even your enemy as if it's your friend. Do I have a witness in here? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Not only was Jesus, because he had power, his power under control, not only was he able to call his enemy his friend, secondly, because he had his power under control, he was able to set others free, but he allowed himself to be bound. The Bible says in verse 50, that they came and they laid hands on Jesus. That is, they forcibly took him. They arrested Jesus, if you will. Oh, child of God, how could they, how could Jesus allow them to arrest him? He had the power to get away from them, but he didn't. He had the power to annihilate every one of them on the spot, but he didn't. He had the power to disappear out of their sight, but he didn't. Matter of fact, Peter picked up a sword and tried to decapitate one of the servants of the high priest. He missed his mark and cut the man's ear off. Jesus picked his ear up and healed him because he wouldn't allow his disciples to resort to violence in his defense. He said, put your sword in his place. And then he quoted a well-known proverb, those who take up the sword will perish by the sword. In other words, violence only begets violence. He said, now listen, Peter, I need you to understand something. That if I wanted to fight, I don't need your help. Do you not now think that I can't pray to my father 
and my father will, t will send 12 legions of angels. Now a legion represented 6,000 Roman soldiers. 12 legions represent 72,000 soldiers. Listen, child of God. He said, if I wanted to, I could pray to my father and my father will send 72,000 angels. Now I need to tell you what one angel can do. Second Kings chapter 19 verse 35 says that one angel killed 185,000 Assyrians in one night. And if one angel could kill 185,000 what do you think 72,000 angels could do? He said, Peter, if I wanted to fight, I know how to fight. I know how to fight. I know how to fight. But I'm going to allow them to bind me. I'm going to allow them to put me in fetters. I'm going to allow them to arrest me. What was it that held Jesus' hands? It wasn't those chains. It was the love he had in his heart for us. Matter of fact, it was that same love that held him to that cross. It wasn't those nails that held him there. The only thing that kept him on that cross was his love for us. That's why we say he would not come down from the cross just to save himself. But he decided to die on the cross just to save me. Because had he come down from that cross, I would be lost. Had he come down from that cross, Jerry would be over for you. Had he come down from that cross, none of us would be going to heaven tonight. Now, had it been me, Seeing how they manhandled Jesus, I would have said, get him, Jesus. Get, get him, get him. Get him, Jesus. Don't let them treat you. Get him, Jesus. You see, I would have practiced a get him theology because I want the Lord to get, get them. Are you with me? But Jesus practiced a take it theology that sometimes when you have the power to get them, you got to ask God to help you to take it. Pat yourself and say, Lord, help me keep my power under control. Because this mouth of mine wants to give them a piece of my mind. This mouth of mine tempts me to say some stuff that I'll regret later. So, Lord, help me to keep, keep my power. Keep my power under control. Are y'all with me? So when that coworker that works in the next cubicle beside you that gets on your last black nerve and you want to get at him, Lord, help me to keep my power under control. Do I have a witness in here? One thing about getting old, Jerry, I don't preach as long <laughs> as I used to because I'm on the last point now. <laughs> and that is, Jesus was able to keep his power under control. Because of that, he could call his enemy his friend. Because of that, he had the power to set other people free. But he allowed himself to be bound. But there's one last thing, and that's my lesson for the night. I'm in my seat. Because he had his power under control, he had the power to win by appearing to lose. Everything in the passion scene seems to point to the fact that Jesus has lost. He's been arrested by a mob of people carrying swords and clubs. One of his own disciples have bet has betrayed him and led the arresting party to where he was in the garden. And all of his disciples eventually left him, fled and left him alone. By all appearances, it seems that the enemy has Jesus in checkmate. 
But Jesus was confident that he was going to win, although it appeared he was going that he was losing. Why? Because he understood that while his enemy had a plan, God had bigger plans. His enemies. They thought they had a full, a foolproof plan. Their plan was to arrest Jesus, try Jesus, and kill Jesus. They were hell-bent on getting rid of this controversial revolutionary. But what they didn't know is that while they had their evil plan in place, God had a bigger plan that was trumping their plan. And Jesus tells us twice why he allows them to arrest him, try him, and kill him. He said, I'm going to tell you why. In verse 54 and verse 56, he said, so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. In other words, I know you got your plans, but what you don't realize is that God is using your evil plan in order to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets. Do I have a witness in here? So Jesus was able to trust God to, to lose in order to win. Can I ask you a question tonight? Have you ever been in a situation where you had to lose in order to win? Do I have a witness here? A boss on the job treats you badly but instead of you retaliating you held your peace you had to lose in order to win ah oh, a spouse hasn't been treating you right but instead of you leaving the marriage you prayed for them you had to lose in order to win a friend of many years betrayed your trust but instead of ending the relationship you realize that she needed you more than you needed her you had to lose in order to win a child disobeys everything you try to tell them to do but instead of giving up on that child you put them in the hands of God you had to lose in order to win you spoke to somebody the other day they heard you say how you doing and they ignored you but instead of you giving them a piece of your mind you said well have a good day anyhow you had to lose in order to win somebody betrayed you but but you, instead of getting back at them, you ask God to help you forgive them. You had to lose in order to win. Child of God, our Christian faith requires us to face this paradox that in order to win, sometimes you got to be willing to lose. But this is antithetical to our win at all cost attitude. We were taught from childhood, you got to win. You got to come in first place. Don't let nobody outdo you. You've got to excel. Do I have a witness here? But the Christian faith was founded on paradoxical principles. Listen to Jesus when he said the first shall be last and the last shall be first. That's a paradox. Listen to Jesus when he said he that exalts himself shall be brought down but he that humbles himself shall be lifted up. That's a paradox. Listen to Jesus when he said the greatest of you shall become a servant. That's a paradox. Listen to Jesus when he said if they hit you on one cheek turn the other. That's a paradox. I've come to tell you today that if you're going to be like Jesus sometimes you've got to be willing to lose in order to win. So when you go home tonight and your significant other wants to start some mess with you and wants to argue with you and wants to get on your last nerve, can I give you some advice? Go home and lose. Go home and lose. Lose and let them argue with themselves. Do I have a witness here? Let me tell you sometimes you got to be willing to lose in order to win. That's the message of Easter. The message of Easter says I can risk being crucified, being arrested on Thursday, crucified on Friday, go to hell on Saturday because I believe God has greater resurrection plans for me on Sunday morning. Sometimes you've got to lose in order to win. That's what happened to Joseph when his brothers hated him and threw him in the pit and 
they said you never amount to anything but he rose to being second in command and he told his brothers you meant it for evil but God meant it for good you had to lose in order to win let me get in my seat how I gonna get out of here it is October 1974 it was the biggest boxing match of the 20th century George Foreman against Muhammad Ali it was called the rumble in the jungle but by this time Clay or Ali was not the Cassius Clay that he used to be when he whipped up on Sonny Liston. He could no longer sting, float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. George Foreman, on the other hand, was the most powerful boxer of Ali's day. He hit harder than anybody. All of the pundits said Ali can't win. All of them said Foreman is going to wear him out. So when the fight started, Ali did something that nobody saw coming. Instead of coming out swinging, he laid against the ropes. Foreman was swaying, wailing on him and hitting him over and over again his corner was bamming on the floor saying get off the ropes get off the ropes but Ali said he's bigger than me he's stronger than me I've got to lose a while in order to win he let Farmer box himself out but in round number eight Ali had a Popeye moment he said that's all I can stand and I can't stand no more and Ali came out swinging and knocked George Farmer out he had to lose in order to win. That's all Jesus is doing. Back there in that garden, he was just laying against the rope. When they marched him from Judgment Hall to Judgment Hall, he was laying against the ropes. Can I get a witness? When they spat in his face, he was laying against the ropes. When they put a crown on his shoulder and march him out to Golgotha, he was laying against the ropes. When they hung him high, stretched him wide, and dropped him low, he was laying against the ropes. Wickedness, a wild man reign, Satan's cause may seem to gain. Thank you, my friend and brother, Dr. Watson, for helping us to better realize that sometimes we have to lose in order to win. 
but winning can come after losing thank you so much hallelujah hallelujah oh what a word what a word we have been blessed to hear in this house on this evening at all on the heels of this powerful message there might be somebody here who needs to make that all important decision to come to the Lord I wish I could tell you you've got tomorrow but tomorrow is not promised but I can tell you this with certainty you have right now what will you do with right now don't let this tremendous opportunity pass you by that might be somebody in the number who has not yet entered into a personal relationship with Jesus that can happen this very very hour there might be somebody else here who says pastor I was once a part of the army of the saved but I fell by the wayside and I made some bad mistakes and I wonder will the Lord forgive me and take me back the answer is a resounding yes yes he will there might be somebody else here who says pastor I am a child of God I am saved but I've been praying for God to guide me to a good church and maybe the Lord has spoken to your heart and told you this is your hour this is your time walk out don't let this opportunity pass you by Will everyone please stand? So many wonderful things about Jesus. Hallelujah. So many wonderful things about him. Will you come? Oh, so many wonderful things about Jesus. There are so many wonderful things about Him. Is that one who'll come, whether you're in the balcony or on the floor level? So many wonderful things. About Jesus. about Jesus, there are so many wonderful things about Him. Oh, His name is wonderful. He's a wonderful counselor. His name, oh, he's a wonderful counselor, he's a mighty God, everlasting, oh, everlasting. of peace and there are so many I got to tell you that anybody know that there are so many so many wonderful things oh so many wonderful things about God 
Bless you. As we get ready now, so ably, so powerfully proclaimed in this place. And we're going home now with a better perspective of keeping our power under control. We're also going home with a better perspective on the fact that we can lose in order to win. Thank you, Reverend Watson. Now, this is just the first evening. And if it came out like this on the first night, I don't know what you got, what the Lord's given you for tomorrow night. But I think all of us are going to try to be here to receive what thus saith the Lord. God bless you, God bless you. As we get ready to go, if there are those who've come in since the offertory period, as you exit, amen, our ushers are at the door with offering baskets to receive your offering contributions. We want to bless this preacher financially, amen. And we certainly want you to join me in doing your very best. Amen. Keeping him lifted up in prayer. Keeping this revival lifted up in your prayers. But also, amen, doing your very best. Amen. 
in the area of our financial support. So the ushers are at the door. If you are not one of those who were able to give when you first came in, amen. Please see the ushers, amen, amen. Do all of you all have baskets? I see baskets at one, I uh, see there, there. All right, hold them up, amen. Amen, God bless you, amen. God bless you. Now, as we get ready to go, will we all please stand? We want to be able to get you in here and out at a good time. Can you say amen? Now, I believe they had dinner downstairs. I believe that was prior. I don't know. Amen. Correct me now if it's prior or after. Prior. Amen. Amen. Uh, so do know that on tomorrow evening you can come early. Amen. And have dinner downstairs in the, the beautiful fellowship hall. Amen. And then come on up here and get a spiritual meal. Amen. From our preacher. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Have you been blessed tonight? Would you just turn over and tell somebody, I've been blessed tonight. God bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Father, we thank you afresh for your preach word. Thank you, dear Father, for using the man of God in such a powerful fashion to bless our souls. Father, it's been food for our souls, encouragement for our spirits, and we thank you. Now, dear Father, as we prepare to exit this sanctuary and make our way to our various homes and respective destinations, we pray your continued blessings upon each and every one gathered here. And Father, we shall remain faithful in giving you the glory, honor, and praise as we get ready for tomorrow. We say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And amen, amen, amen. God bless you.